here's a guy who has been to his share of ham fest. That's uh, Joe Eisenberg, K0NEB, of course, the kit building editor for CQ Magazine and the Cat in the Hat cat from uh, from Dayton and uh, who does the kit building forum. And you've been licensed uh, since when? When did you get your license? It was in the 70s, wasn't it? Earlier, yeah. 1969. I think 69. 69. 1969. All right. So, you've so I've been licensed 46 years. Yeah, so you ain't no rookie, that's for sure. How many ham fests would you say you have been to? Well, I, I don't think I could count, really. The The farthest one was Friedrichshafen last year, yeah. uh, which was an incredible experience. I've been to 36 or 37 Dayton's, um, uh, at least 15 Huntsville, um, and lots of others. Somebody in the chat room mentioned Joplin is coming up this next weekend. Unfortunately, I won't be there, but... Uh, you talk about supporting local ham fest. There's one at the end of this month uh, I'll be at in Papillion, Nebraska, and another one in Springfield, Nebraska, a couple weeks later. So uh, we have uh, several local area ones coming up, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a few others in the in the region, at least within a driving distance, that I'll make before uh, the snow flies here in Nebraska and we don't have any more ham fest. All right, so tell us a little bit about, for those who may not know about what your background is, how you got started in kits. You are, you work in the electronics business, actually. You, uh, tell the, the viewers and, and listeners exactly what it is you do and how you got interested in ham radio and what got you into kit building. Well, the, the way I got into ham radio actually was through a family friend, and that was Leo Meyerson, W0GFQ, a very close friend of the family. And Leo Meyerson was the founder and head of World Radio Laboratories in Council Bluffs, Iowa, across the river from my hometown in Omaha. And, uh, of course, they made the Globe line and Galaxy line of radios and Globe Scout kits and things like that, as well as selling other uh, makes and models of radios and lots and lots of kits. So at a very early age, I was exposed to it through him. And so he was my personal Elmer. And uh, when I was 14, that's when I got my novice license and I took my novice class in the cafeteria of World Radio Laboratories in Council Bluffs. And that's really how we did that in the Omaha area back then. Uh, the clubs didn't teach it, it was taught by World Radio. And uh, so I've always enjoyed building and uh, uh, as I got older, uh, my kit started working more and blowing up less. So um, <laughs> it's important. <laughs> I uh, uh, I've always just enjoyed it, and then finally uh, uh, decided that when Heathkit went out of business, there were other kit makers there, but people thought that kit building was going to become a lost art. So I decided I would take up the reins, uh, not as a manufacturer, but as a a teacher of the art of kit building. And so I began speaking uh, starting in 97, I think it was, at the Dayton Hamvention on kit building. And it kind of grew from there. Uh, and as you know, six years ago in your car, uh, I began yep. the career with CQ Magazine. Now, in that's the real that, world. That's a neat in, story, by the way. We'll get into that a little bit more. But okay, in the real world, what, what are you doing? In, in the, the real world, my real world job is I'm an IT field tech, which means mostly I fix broken printers uh, and networks and some Wi-Fi issues and so forth, uh, utilizing my uh, RF background to improve Wi-Fi systems and so forth for our customers. But uh, Sometimes we'll have a laptop that has a broken power jack, and so our laptop guys will take the board out and get the jack ordered, and I unsolder the one and put the uh, new ones on. And we have a fixed laptop instead of having to buy a new one. Saves a lot of money. Um, so I do get to solder a little bit at work. In fact, yesterday I had a part fail on a main board and a very large printer. And so I got to unsolder a part and solder a new one in and get them going. Uh, so if you can save a $60,000 printer with a $20 soldering iron, I'd say that's pretty good. Yeah, no kidding. Now, chat room, if you have questions for Joe, Joe's going to be with us for the whole show tonight. And so get them to, uh, get them to us. Amanda is online now and she is uh, uh, waiting for your questions. So, yeah, so six years ago, we're at the Huntsville Ham Fest. Tell the story about how Rich Moses and 
uh, asked you to be a part of CQ magazine because this is kind of cool because I'm I'm actually I'm I'm quite honored to be a, a little part of this story. So well, tell them tell them how had, that happened. We had the Young Ham of the Year um, from Houston. Trying to remember his call, and uh, we had yourself and myself and Richard W2VU, yeah. the editor of CQ magazine, in your car. And he said, you know, he, he, you know, of course, wanted my photos of the Young Ham of the Year ceremony like usual. But he, he said, you know, I've seen your photos. You're good at that. And uh, uh, I've seen your presentations and wonder if you'd like to write a couple sample articles for CQ magazine. So uh, I did. I sent him two articles complete with photographs. And uh, it wasn't but a few days after I sent them to him that he said, OK, that's November and December. Let's keep going and let's see how that works. Well, a couple months later, I think it was by the February edition, they had a problem. And that was with the little cards that come in the magazine that has the little blanks on it. You can check off what what areas of the hobby you like, like DXing and CW and sideband and contests and so forth. There was nothing for kit building. Well, I think they said like 27 or 28 percent the first time that my article appeared started writing that in. And it started getting into the 30 percent range or so, 35 percent. So they had to stop and reprint the cards to make sure that there was a blank for kit building. That, that's cool. So tell us a little bit about what uh, what some of the the, the cool kit stuff that you saw at Huntsville because there was a lot of kits. That's what I, that's what kits are back. Kits are hot. It's, it's neat that, that hams are getting into building their own stuff and not being just appliance operators. And that's something that I'm, in fact, you challenged me. You, you gave me this little guy here. It's a, uh, it's, as I'm holding this up, what is this exactly that I'm going to okay, be butchering? Uh, and I'm going to show you what it's going to look like when it's done. This is a uh, four. Oh no, mine, mine won't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure it will. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll pick it up. Uh, it is a $4 kit. It is a CW transceiver. It's, it's a Chinese version of what we call the Pixie 2, uh, which is a very simple two-transistor uh, CW transceiver. And uh, a very interesting design. The Pixies have been around for a long time. But amazingly, now you can get this kit. You know, just this jack alone, if I ordered that, would cost me two or three bucks. So for four bucks to get a complete kit like this is pretty darn amazing. And so uh, uh, that's the, the challenge. I have given Don the challenge to actually put the kit together himself and make a contact on 40 meter CW, which means, of course, you have to learn CW and, well, and I, get good. Yeah, well, I did. I did learn CW. I'm, I was a I was a low code tech, not a no code tech. So uh, I did learn CW, and I can actually I can send pretty good. Um, but receiving is something I'm definitely going to have to uh, brush up on. But no, I will do that. I, the gauntlet has been thrown down, so I'm I, I'm ready for that.